It'd be easy to pass this morning with him. Yeah. Let's pray. Let's, let's ask God to speak to us on Easter morning. It'd be so easy to preach right now. You can share so many things with him that. Let's, let's hear what he's saying to us as well. Yes. Father, we, just, we thank you. We thank you for everything this weekend represents. And even like communion, when we take the bread and the cup, we do it and remember it. This morning we remember you. We're asking your Father us to speak to us. And I will go as far as to say, speak to us as a room. Speak to us personally. You know this room right here. You know every life. You know every emotional makeup. You know every situation in this room. And if you were standing literally in my shoes, like I believe you are spiritually and theologically, but if, if, if you were standing up there and someone handed you a microphone, what would you say for the next half hour or four minutes? That's what we want to hear. Lord. We're just yielding to you. Now as I'm praying, guys, please open your heart. Just tell him you want him to speak to you. Amen. Position yourself. Tell him, look, I'm not just here to pay homage to God on Easter Sunday. Amen. I want to hear your voice. I yield to you, Lord, and I ask you to come and speak to my heart. Would you do that? In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yay. All right. So, uh, and it's a big deal. We got up there and, and uh, stood up and started singing these amazing songs. Pastor Barry went from he's our Savior to he's our friend. Susie said, you know what? He's our Lord. He's all the other. See, Jesus, Lord, means supreme one, the governing factor, the ruling factor, the supreme one, the one that governs and rules and things, right? So he's the Lord of your life. And uh, being a friend is, is a big deal. A lot of people know Jesus as the one that made a Christ to take him to heaven. And uh, honestly, I don't preach Jesus that way. I never got saved here again. I got saved to become one with him, to get to know him, to become the person he created me to be. The reason I realized I got saved was so heaven back into me, so that I could be what he intended me to be from the beginning. So I didn't come into a self-serving gospel. I didn't come into a gospel that benefited me. I actually came into a gospel that transformed and changed me. And here I am, 22 years later, going through life just like we all are, situations, circumstances, stuff. Things happen, guys. God never promised me a glass he see, but he promised he would live in me and shine for me if I would let him. So in the hardest times is when you shine the most, when you're squeezed, that's when Jesus is really revealed. And it's not that we're praying for our times, we're just not afraid of it because it's never the point. Being like Him is the point. Being like Him is the point. <laughs> Sometimes we've been so far removed from that, we think, well, yeah, but He's Jesus, we're just following people, we're just this and that and this. No, no, no. He filled us with the same spirit that was us in the death. He's given us understanding through His Word. He's made us one with him. Listen to what he said in Matthew. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to heaven unless they pray that prayer. I mean, that's not what he said. And no one comes to the So what is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What did he come? She's the way back to the Father. We were living fatherless. Guys. We were fathered from above in the beginning. He said in Matthew 23, 9, Call no man on earth your father. That's not wrong to call your dad father. What it means is you came forth from him. The only reason you have a natural dad is because man came forth from God in the beginning. You have one true father who you came forth from in the beginning. And he said he's in heaven. Do you know how many people regulate their life through their natural life, through their biology, through their biological, their hereditary? They say, well, this runs in my family. Well, this is the way we are. And all of a sudden, we're deciding a life based on our own forefathers and our own earthly inheritance. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Don't call any man your father. You came forth from one. And he's in heaven. He wants us to not let anything we experience on the earth deter us from becoming everything he paid for us to be or what we represent this morning as we See, Jesus died, he rose again. You saw the temple curtain was torn when he was crucified. And from top to bottom, that's significant. From top to bottom. Yeah? So I wonder who tore that thing. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, man didn't have to go behind a veil, and man didn't have to have a man representing because a man was representing him, and his name is Jesus. And he's giving me a way to go back to the Father. Now, I want to share something. This morning, it's really big on my heart to Guys, if you don't know me, please bear with me. I know if you get clear, don't be hurt by what I'm saying. I'm just saying, 
We, we are going to miss it totally. If all we think is God is, is there and we need to acknowledge Him now and then or live a certain way or don't do this because it's wrong, do this because it's right, and we'll have no relationship, that friend thing, no intimacy. Watch this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the what is that? Guys, that's an invite into knowing him. That's an invite into intimacy. What's John 17, 3 say? And this is eternal life. He didn't say that you pray a prayer to show your names in the book called life. And this is eternal life, that you might know him, the only true God, and his son, Jesus Christ. Guys, the whole goal of the cross is to open up the door again so we come back in and be Father. God, have intimacy, relationship, and communion with Him. What you do is you give your life to Him. You don't incorporate Him into your now life. You give Him your life. It's what water baptism is all about. You go to die so you can live. In, in, in Christianity, you can't live until you die. Like, you can't incorporate Jesus into your life. You can't bring Him into your ways, your wisdom, the way that seems. You can't bring him into your former attitudes, your former emotional makeup, your former ways. Some pastors will say, and I'm not criticizing pastors, some pastors will say, this gospel will cost you everything. And I think I know what they're trying to say, so they make it sound like it's so hard. Really, all it costs you is giving up everything you never were anyway. <laughs> like, give up everything you never were anyway. What you were born into is out. You were born into the fall of man. Like I said it last night, if you weren't here, nobody had to teach you to be angry, jealous, full of pride, self-conscious, or self-centered. That came with the package called the fall of man. The trouble is, we think that's normal life. And honestly, it's perverted falling life. Every man for himself is the biggest lie on the planet. It's what's destroying the earth, man living for himself. And because we get so self-centered and so full of pride, we think it's everybody else's fault. So we think, well, this would just change, and they would just change, and they would just knock it off, and God would just, and we always think we have the answer to make it better, and the whole thing that's wrong is every man's for himself. Jesus didn't come and say, if you want to follow me, pray a prayer and assure you're in my book. He said, if you're going to follow me, deny your Why? No man was ever made for himself. Man was made for the image of God. Read your Bible. Man was made for the likeness of God. Man was made to love. And when Adam got cut off from love, man became in need of love. And we were born into that lie. We were born into the lie of needing love. We're created to be love, not need love. Why? Because we're grafted into the lie. And he's the source of love. So we're fulfilled in him. So from living fulfilled in Him, we live fulfilled this way. We're full, we're cups running over. We're loved by God and we love one another. It's pretty simple. If we're not careful, we even need God instead of love God. And we're still selfish in our Christianity. Now we have the right to be mad at God. We hold Him accountable. And if this happens, I'm ticked off. But we have a thing right now. We're not talking. I hear people talk like that. Well, I haven't talked to the Lord, but we're working through something. Like, right? come on.
that's getting born again. And when you do that, the blood that he shed, that right there, you know what that is right there? That's a picture of what God did to Jesus. He made Jesus to be sin. He didn't crucify and, and curse and kill his son. He killed sin on the cross. He said he cursed sin in the flesh. He made him to be sin. It's in Corinthians. So we can be found right in the sight of God. He didn't do any wrong. He took the wrong so we could become right. But we've done wrong, but we're seen as if we've never done wrong. That's amazing. He became what we were so we could become what he is, a son from the beginning. Yeah? And he took our sin in his body on a tree. There's the picture. That we have been died to sin. What's the root of every sin? Self-centered thinking. There's no sin that's not attached to a man thinking for himself. There's not one sin you can name that doesn't connect with a man living for his own flesh. That's why it says if you live by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So what he do? He became what we were so we could die to what we thought we were. And become what we were always intended to be and start living by the Spirit. Friends, this is born again. This is born again. This isn't paying homage to God, singing hallelujah to the Lamb on a certain day. It's not coming here on a certain morning because it's 11 o'clock and this is where you come. It's waking up and knowing Him. It's waking up and encountering Him and being with Him and exchanging with Him and fellowshipping with Him so that in your day, you start looking like Him. Yeah? So your attitudes start changing. Your disposition starts changing. Your responses in life start changing. All of a sudden, we're not just a bunch of beating down people up our life, crying out to God to change things. All of a sudden, we're actually filled with the Spirit. We're alive in Him. And come hell or high water, we shine. Yeah? And when we're done wrong, we pursue peace. Not an attorney. Sorry, if you're an attorney. <laughs> I won't give you much business. I realize there's a need for attorneys. We just settled on the house for my daughter. We needed an attorney. But the whole liability thing, we better be careful, Judge. All of a sudden, we live as if everybody owes us the one little thing out of step. We're going to hold you accountable. You better be sure glad that God doesn't live that way towards you. You better be sure glad that God isn't watching you like a hawk and waiting for you to slip the hawk. Because you couldn't live hardly at all under that. Liberty that I have in God. It's the grace that doesn't empower me to stay weak. It actually brings the best out of me. It gives me confidence. We put God and rebuilds integrity and honor. But all of a sudden I get a healthier, clearer view of my life and I won't sell cheap because I'm not for sale. And all of a sudden I realize I was bought with the price. And I'm not my own. Christ in me. The hope of glory. It's not my confession of Christ. It's Christ in me. You all with me on this? And we just got news yesterday of a suicide. One of my friends committed suicide a week, two weeks ago. Just baffles me. Christian man that got overwhelmed with suicide. Just baffles me. I've been preaching for months. Suicide, biggest lie on the planet. Why? A man gets deceived into thinking his life is so much his own that he thinks he has the right to take what's not even his. Because it's never just your life. It's his life in you. He never created you to be a part of it. He never created you to live one day separate from him. He created you to live in him and him in you. So when a man commits suicide, guess what he's doing? He's taking his life in him. So you're not just taking your life, you're taking his life in you. What a lie. What a tragic deception that a man is so committed where that he thinks he has the right to take something that's not even his. I hear people say, well, it's my life. It never was. It was always his life in when there's nobody alive that isn't alive by the choice of God, there is a time to be born, and here you sit. The Bible teaches your existence is the yes and amen of God. That He saw you and predestined you for the foundation of the world. We adopted Him as a son. And the fall of man has allowed us to get so individualistic and so self-centered and believe, actually believe, that life is my own. And the only reason I'm here is for His image. So watch. Life lived apart from pursuing his image is living life without grace. That's why people think life's a grind. That's why people think life is so hard to get through. Because they're living life for themselves when they're created for his image. So you're living life apart from empowerment. You're living life apart from grace. How many times have you heard people say how tough life is? Don't 
Once you do yourself injustice, as they go, Pastor, that's pretty easy for you to say. Everything's probably going great. You don't know what I'm going through. See, that's doing great injustice to yourself, this, this, this service. Because you don't know what I've been through, and you don't know what anybody else has been through. What you're doing is you're making your story about it more than the truth. You're letting your go through being your identity, and you're challenging truth with it. Come on. And all of a sudden, you're making it all about the hell you've been through instead of the heaven you're called to. And all of a sudden, you're letting yesterday matter more than your present and your future. So tomorrow is always yesterday. And yesterday is always Lord. Yeah. And the way it was growing up, it's always Lord. <coughs> and what they did to you, it's always Lord. You say, but I was touched on. I wonder if I was. Well, I didn't have a daddy. I wonder if I didn't. I wonder if mine was an alcoholic my whole life. They never said, I love you. And I actually cursed me out. And I had to pick him up, stagger him up. See, we compare ourselves among ourselves with all that it's not wise. Because that's not where we're going to find truth in the industry. And making an excuse for not believing isn't cool. My wife has said last night was an identity crisis. At the same time, my, my son was doing drugs and my daughter pursued something that was just so not wise and cost her eight solid years of her life. All at the same time. And if you, all you have is rational thinking and you're a Christian for you, you're wondering why your world's falling apart, why everybody you say you love isn't loving you, what am I doing wrong, how am I failing, because you'll weigh all this and how everybody's doing and the choices they're making based on how good it is. I'll tell you what's good that life's in me and I'm looking to them and looking through different eyes at them and I'm not seeing what I would have saw before I knew him. Knowing him changed me when they were all a mess. And here I still am, a loving daddy, and I believe a very good husband, and I have a precious wife who's rebounded and recovered, and my kids are all doing well all these years later. But I'll tell you what, 10 years ago, it like a bomb blew up in my home. And it wasn't because I was living like a hypocrite. It was because they were making choices. And you can't be a Christian conditional on everybody's choices that you say you love. You have to be a Christian based on the glory of who he is, so the glory of who he is shines through you when people make bad choices. Right. And you gotta be sure you don't cut people off based on what they're doing, because he didn't cut you off on your darkest day. Yeah? yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry, I'm a little too aggressive right now. I'm not mad at nobody. Yeah. Are you okay? I'm yeah. back off the chuck a little. We got pretty serious here on me supporting. <laughs> Come on, we just got to understand why he came, guys. He didn't come just to bless us. He didn't come so that you can have your cake and eat it too. He came to pay a price to empower you to live in him and him in you. So you can actually fill with the spirit, his life, his nature, his wisdom, and his will. Yeah? yeah. Ephesians 3 says that above all these things, to, it says to know the love of Christ which past his knowledge. So to know the love of Christ, which passes knowing, two different words. One's a heart knowing, experience it's not, it's like, whoa. The other one is one plus one is two, it's gnosis. This is more like an epignosis, it's an experiential relational knowing. So to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, right, is to be filled with all the fullness of God. Who knows that we're all without realizing that seeking fullness? We're seeking fulfillment. We're seeking to fill voids. We're seeking to find esteem, prestige, honor, connectivity, comfort, smooth sailing, love. <coughs> Guys, we're on this drive to get fulfilled. Why? Because there's this big hole of unfulfillment through the fall of man, and we got cut off and separated from love. So now instead of being loved from him to others, we're in need of love because we're cut off from love. Even though God loves us, we're not grafted and connected in. That's what the cross is about. To reconnect you and join you back to love. But that's not missing the point. It's not just God loves you, it's you becoming that same love. It's not just God forgives you, it's you becoming forgiveness. It's not just God is merciful, it's you becoming merciful. What he's doing is he's making us after his own kind. He's, he's, he's made us in his image. He made us in his own likeness, both male and female. And he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. We here coming together again pregnant. He's saying, cover the earth with my glory and fill the earth with my image. In Genesis, we think, wow, God just gave us permission to come together and have kids. It's, it's deeper than that. He's talking about his image the whole time. What he's saying is, wow, you look just 
looks like me and everything that I am is in you. Wow, you look like me too and everything in, in, in you is, is in me and me and you. Come together and reproduce the same and fill the earth with my glory. We've turned it into needs and I'm not getting any younger and I'd love to be a mother and I'm being a child and hey, you'll do. I'm <laughs> just saying. Or I'm lonely, I'm hurt, they broke my heart, now we're vulnerable, they say the thing we long to hear, now we're doing something we'd never do if we weren't vulnerable. Yes. And all of a sudden we're just decided constantly by the moment because we don't know who we are in the moment. And we're always trying to meet a need, and always filling the gap, and always slapping on a band-aid. And enough of that, after a while you're pretty cut up. And then people leave a break, Get hard. Pray and get hard. Please don't get hard. And please don't pray. Understand there's a higher truth about your life. Amen. People don't understand. They let their heart get angry at people. They talk about those people two, three times a week. And then it goes kind of away. And it's still there. And you haven't talked to them for two years. And you think you're winning because you cut them off and the whole time. What they did is deciding you all the time. You're actually part of a factor of what they did. And you keep your eyes yeah, you cut them off and talk to them for 10 years, but you hear their name and it still hurts you. For 10 years, in some way, you've been representing what they accomplished through what you believe and see. It's like on your picture, they should just sign your name. Because you're a product of whatever you won't let go. So I don't think this is so detrimental to your life because it keeps the fence alive. It keeps the wrong alive. Unforgiveness is so detrimental because it keeps that thing alive. Forgiveness washes me as if it never happened. That's why the forgiveness of the Lord is so amazing. That's what this cross picture is all about. Think of the lashings and the beatings Jesus endured. The Bible says that they beat him and beat him and beat him until he's marred beyond description. He was martyred more than any of the sons of men. Guys, we ought to get this. This isn't just 40 strikes minus one. This wasn't just the cat of nine tails and we studied out the metal and the shards and the whatever they put in there and whack, whack, whack 39 times. No, no, no. This was clubs upside the head. This was punching in the face. This was ripping out the beard, pulling the hair. This guy named Jesus was so beat up and so mutilated that Isaiah records before it ever took place that he was marred more than any of the sons of men. That means the worst of men ever looked at the hands of men, Jesus was a step towards. Now how disfigured are you when they burn you on a stake? Just think of the barbaric things men have done to men over generations. Come on. They, so they take you, they, they take this ritual, they tie her to a stake and they say, she's a Jesus lady. We don't like the way she dances, she's into weird things, we don't believe in her Jesus, and they light the fire at the bottom of the stake. There she is, and she's worshiping Jesus as the flame to burn. That would be a pretty good thing. <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? you do your best. <laughs> but watch this. When the fire's done, can you even tell us, Miss Rachel? When the fire's done, would you even know it was a lady? He was marred more than any of us. We only get sober about this gospel and we'll get religious and traditional. This must just turn sentimental Eastern. He did something amazing with the great purpose. It's why I don't have time to have an attitude that's not productive. It's why I don't have time to have issues with people. It's why I don't have time to complain. I don't have time to be angry and frustrated and judgmental anymore because I realize none of that is who I was created to be. And he paid a price to get me free from those things. Because those things don't bring life, they cost life. They make me right, they make you wrong, they make my way greater than your way. They're self-righteous and they're full of lies. All those attitudes that we think are normal. Come on. A man can come home from work. He's created for God's image. He's to give Jesus to the people around him. That's his reason for living, if you read your Bible. Instead, he gets overwhelmed, pent up, shut up, and one day he explodes and gives everybody a piece of his mind. He comes home like a barnyard man and tells his wife how he just gave a piece of his mind. And he feels good in that moment as if he's a cop. You see how shallow that is? Yeah. How is every man for me? He's not supposed to give anybody a piece of his mind. He's supposed to give people a life of the I lived this way before I was saved. I'd tell you off and feel like I was winning. 
Yeah. And it was the total perversion of what I'm created for. It is amazing how temporally good it felt and made you feel like somebody in the moment, but how hollow and shallow is that because the world hasn't changed. You see what I'm saying? He hung there, and you couldn't even tell it was him. You couldn't even tell he was a man. He had to be so, because of the word of God, he had to be so mutilated, bruised, swollen, bloody, whatever, disfigured, that when you looked at him, there's no way you could tell who he was. Why? Because when sin got done with man in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. His appearance was lost in the image. And he got reduced to something he wasn't. So Jesus came and gave up his appearance to pay the price to give the right to the image and glory of God back upon So that we can wake up again. Wake up again and love like you. Wake up and forgive like we've been forgiven. Make peace like he's been Yeah, you say, well, you have a life to fight, but a good fight of faith. The only fight you're supposed to have is a good fight of faith. You don't fight people and you don't fight the devil. You fight the good fight of faith. That's how you fight the devil. That's the weapon of your warfare. The truth crushes lies. The good fight of faith. Never lose sight of who you've become in the midst of it all. Never lose sight of who you are now that all hell is right. Never lose sight of what you're created for and called to even when your closest friend or your spouse makes a grave mistake. Never letting what they did decide who you are when he did already said that. Never get tricked into saying, well, you don't know what I'm going through now that he went through something that decides you. Guys, all I'm talking about is simple Christianity. It's just been far removed and we've got tricked if we're not careful into making it all about Jesus blessing us, taking care of us, protecting us, and providing us. And you have a lot of discouraged people that go to church that are overwhelmed by life instead of overwhelmed by the life in them. And all of a sudden we're a needs driven ministry crazed people instead of the ministers of the earth. You guys okay? Come on, it's Easter. I gotta preach stuff. You know? I preach this no matter what we can do because he's alive. <laughs> Honestly, I live this way, I think this way. If not, life's going to sneak up on you. You're going to let something matter more that doesn't matter most. And all of a sudden, you're only doing as good as life is going instead of who you call the creator to be. Come on, please don't do that. The Bible tells you to put off all these things that don't produce life. Come on, think about it. Animosity in our homes. I'm not being legalistic right now. Just hear me out. Animosity in our homes. The need to be right. But why do I get to turn? But how about you can leave a service like this and have a genuine argument over where you're going to eat. <laughs> and get so familiar with each other and disregard that I mean it's a genuine tension-filled, needs-driven argument over where you're going to eat. The need to have your way. This Burger King slogan, had it your way in five minutes. <laughs> Burger King doesn't even realize they're trying to keep someone alive and having wants to kill. <laughs> it's not about having it your way, but it's about having it his way. Who cares where you eat as long as you have food? You live in this country, we take it to a Spanish restaurant every corner. And now it's all about selection and choose. Wow, 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 how come last week? Well, we always got to go where you are. Well, how come when I ever get to choose? That is dangerous language. You want to let that die because if you're doing that in that area, that's a lie that a lot of if it matters on that, it matters on things. So the Bible says the way you overcome is you love not your own life unto death. Greater love has no man than this. He lays down his life. Now watch. Prefer others. Consider others more highly than yourself. Don't pursue your own interests, but the interest of Philippians 2. It's all right there. And it talks about the mind that Jesus had. He's the Lord. He's the Son of God. He humbles himself, makes himself with no reputation, and ends up like that to put his life inside of us. That's a big deal. And faith says, wow, that's amazing. You did that for me without asking because you knew the truth about me? Because you wanted to empower me to get out of the lie so you became looking like a lie? You did what you didn't deserve so you could give to me what I was created for and take away what I did deserve? Wow, you did that because you knew something about me. You knew my value, destiny, purpose, and you knew what I'd look like if you'd ever lived in me and I'd surrender. You thought that was worth paying for. That's the gospel. You 
a silent treatment because I'm frustrated? Come on, spouses do it all the time. They express their mood with silence to send a message. It's called control and manipulation. And when you're boasting it, it's not knowing him like we sing. Because he doesn't live that way. He doesn't live that way. And I'm telling you, this stuff happens all the time, and I call it all the time. I, I want to expose that stuff. Because if not, we teach ourselves religion, and we learn how to do something in his name without becoming like him. And all of a sudden, attitudes that he didn't teach us have a right to live in their call to You guys with me? This is an extra message. I didn't know it was going to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know that. Listen, what I'm talking about is a great privilege. It's still believable. You got to yield to the doubt yourself. You know, you got to give yourself. You know, you got to stay alive. Say it. This is what they said. See, the just live by. So we're a body of believers. At least that's what we're called to be. So as a teacher and a leader, as pastors and leaders. We're to always call you to the highest level of belief. Right? If every promise is to the believer, signs are to the believer, wonders are to the believer, and every promise of living and walking like Jesus is to the believer, and you were the enemy, what would you scramble up? You would try to interfere, confuse, and scramble up, but then believe. So guess where the truth is found? Jesus and his life. He didn't say, sing to me and pray to me in your own He said, follow me. That means his life lived is the model we're following. He is the expression of life in the Father. Follow me. He didn't just say, pray over your food and say, now I lay down to sleep. He didn't say, call a pastor when you get married and bring me into your wedding. No, no, no. Follow me. We're very religious society. Yeah. Very religious nation. We bring God into things instead of letting Him become the thing. Yeah? Come on. Why. Parents. Parents have done this for decades. They get their children christened and, and sprinkled and stuff. And a lot of those parents, I've learned, don't even go to church. They just do it because they're, they're, it's a spiritual expression. And the way they're trying to make a statement is, I'm going to dedicate my child to God. The best way to dedicate your child to God is live your life in Christ. You send the greatest pattern of Christ to your child. Yeah. So we make it so impersonal. Okay, we're people, he's God. I'm dedicating you to God, but we're just the way we are. Yeah. And then our whole life, we're seeing the weakness of the thing. After a while, we don't have a heart for God because it's not relevant because he's not here. Let me just encourage you this. And it's not going to happen. It's so weird, though. You can take your children to church. You can make sure you're here. You can make sure you're here and never miss a Sunday and not pursue Christ outside of here. If you're not living Christ outside of here, inadvertently, without realizing, and you're teaching your children that church attendance is Christianity yeah. instead of Christ life. And all of a sudden, you're striving to get to church. Well, we got to go to church. Well, we haven't been there for two weeks. We got to go. And you're getting frustrated trying to get together. We shouldn't have to get together. Well, I thought you were getting there. Well, we're just going. Let's just get there. And then you get there and you get to church. And you're just there. And this is the whole point. Thinking that getting to church is the goal instead of becoming her. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Okay. I'm probably not. I'm going to read something. I'm going to close this. I've read it all the time. I've read this a thousand times over in my life. And it's fresh and it's alive. Look at Colossians 3 with me real quick. See, because this whole thing Jesus did this weekend was to get the lie off of us, get the truth in us. It says he rose at the end of Romans 4. He rose for our justification. That means just as if I've never sinned. So he bore my sin and, his, and your sin in his body on the tree that me having died to sin. That means it's identity, it's stain, it's drive, it's desire, it's belief. I died to it and live for righteousness and by the strength of God. That's powerful, guys. That's called faith. That's called man. God sees me right. We just sang it. What can wash away? Oh, love. 
Wash me white. So live by his God. Live redeemed. Live free. Live clean. Yay. God's not mad at me. Hello. He's for me. He's not against me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. I was lost in darkness. He called me out of darkness and put me in the light of the kingdom of the Son of His love. Right. Filled me with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead and rules His kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. He comes to Barry at some point in his life and he says, Barry, stand before me or he wrote us. Yeah, but Lord, I and I know oh, Lord, I he says, I know who you are and I know who I created you to be. And I pay the price to redeem you and send you into, into or bring you into my kingdom and send you forth my name. I, I, I knight you as righteous in my sight. Oh, it takes you sin, faith, believing that God loves him this much and in love has the ability to remove him from everything he's ever done and everywhere he's ever been. Standing before God, brand new, day one, born again, to live his life in Christ. That's salvation, guys. And he rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. That means you and me stay in right in the sight of God in our conscience and our understanding, which will automatically bleed into our actions. Because if we make the tree good, guess what the fruit is? Good without you trying so hard. Because when you try hard, you think you're failing. But when you believe who you've become, it's never about failing. Are you with me? So I want to read this good. Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. What are you seeking? Things above. Why? Because you were taught things from an earthly perspective. Time to think like the kingdom things. What's Matthew 6.33 say? Seek ye first. What's first? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His Righteousness. You see what's first? How God's thinking. And how He sees you through His Son. That's where you live your life with in God. Now watch this. Verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth. Why you gotta do that? Because your mind will want to go other places. Well, I feel. Yeah, but well, you don't know what you get what I'm saying? Now watch this. For you die and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, because this is true, put to death your members which are on the earth. Listen, guys, He didn't say control, balance, and find out a healthy balance. He said kill the way you know life. Life as you know it, put it to death. Watch. It talks about sexual passions, sex drives and things. Come on. It's not, it doesn't have to be an unholy thing. There's a holy place for union and communion and covenant. There's a holy place for conceiving and reproducing in the presence of God all the time when He created you to be. But be honest with me, the way we became, even it's amazing how, don't be embarrassed how we talk about this in church. You have I mean, four sections of scripture in the Old Testament where they have these lists of the flesh. The first one on every list is sexuality. Why? Because it's sensually driven. It's sensually driven. People have been tricked into just an emotional thing. It's sensually driven. It has nothing to do with honor, covenant, and absolute love. It just has to do with need, vulnerability, and feelings and emotions. And, and he's saying, look, if he says put to death, your members are controlling our fornication, that means any sexual activity outside of covenant marriage. What's he saying? Put to death your sexual urges as you know them, because none of them are legit or real. They get from See, not enough preachers are talking about that moment. It's on every list in the Bible. Sexuality is the first thing on the list. Why? Because it's the biggest exploited topic on the planet. Come on, guys. There's not a topic exploited and more than sexuality. There's not even a close second. You show me a close second to exploiting sexuality. And sensual and lust and women and bodies and skin and movement and Clothes. Come on! And it just takes a draw of passions and urges and desires. And if there's weakness, it'll find it. If there's desire, it'll find it. The first thing on every list is sexuality. Isn't that amazing? People say, well, God gave us a sex drive. No, no, no. Adam gave you the one you know. If you're not born yet, then we can be Adam gave do you realize it's possible to bring Jesus into your life and never become a new one? 
Do you realize it's as easy to ask Him into your heart and receive Him to go to heaven and never let your precepts, your mindsets, and your motives change? Do you realize you can say, Jesus, forgive me and see your need for a Savior and never realize it's not cool to be angry with so and so? And you actually still think you have the right to have renewed and restored your mind. You just ask Him to be in your life instead of letting Him become your own. I never believe the people of the Lord like to say to get them to pray a prayer. I teach people what Christianity is so they can decide if they know it. Do you know what the Bible says? Not me, the Bible, 1 John 4. It says if you love, there's one reason. If you love, you know what love is? Love is taking no account of the wrong done to you. Now, how many do farewell when someone's done wrong to us? That's when you find out when you understand. I can't believe they did that. Can you believe something? You call three people and bring them into your pain. Talk about what so-and-so did when love takes no account of the wrong done to Love doesn't seek its own. Love is patient. There's a joke in the church that says if you pray for patience, you better be serious because God will give it to you. Like, don't make them pray for patience if you don't really want it. It's a joke in the church. But if you're not patient, it means you don't, you're not reflected in love because love is patient. Yeah. Why are we called to avoid the appearance of evil? Because men are evil. If it's just the appearance of evil and not evil, why should we avoid it? Because men think evil. Why? Love thinks no evil. People are perfected in love. So all of a sudden people look at something and, and assume, presume. They see two people in the room for a while and they go, I don't know what they're doing all the time. They just see two people in, in a relationship and they, I'm just being real. But they're doing it. <laughs> the Bible says no. It says avoid the appearance of evil. Why? Because men will think you. Why do they think you? They're not perfected to love. Love thinks no evil. The whole goal of our instruction, verse 31 5, is love. If we miss becoming love, we miss the whole reason why we came. I'm telling you, one day, if, if, if we don't so and grab a hold of this, one day we're going to stand before him and things will be the way they are. I'm not speaking judgment and doom. I'm saying there's a lot of things we could accomplish. There's a lot of rewards. There's a lot of fulfillment. There's a lot of multiplication that God wants to do. But let's make sure that we don't stand before him someday and go, oh, wow. And not have fun well because we have to pursue love. If all you pursue is blessings, you're going to be disappointed. If you're just pursuing life to go your way, you're already in trouble. If you need people to change, stop. You're deceived. It's about you becoming like him. And you're going to run away. Come on. The whole goal of our instruction is love. If we miss becoming love, we miss the whole reason why we did that. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to just read this. I'm sorry. I'm taking it. Are we okay? Are you guys okay? I'm just reading. I'm trying to stop. You know, it's Easter. You've got dinners and family and that's in trouble. Listen, Sunday's not even about to stay in your own. But all we stay in the is more spiritual. There's a marriage between coming and going. I just talked to the pastor and his wife about this. I said, man, every time we come, we have to be careful. We're not just coming because this is the church we get to. One of the pastor's biggest challenges is not turning inward and just trying to have better services so people like me and here or just create an atmosphere where people feel comfortable or safe. No, this is a proving and testing ground. This is an iron shark and iron plane. This is a place where you come to stir in love and good works. Where you start living outside yourself and start living in Him. This is a place where you come to learn what being a Christian is so you live a life in the spirit of you lead. Like the whole reason we should come here is to encounter Him, to honor Him, to thank Him, and to learn of Him so when we leave, we look a little more like Him than when we came. Or we're paying homage to God. I don't think He needs that. And I don't think he needs our song. I don't think he's saying that I wish he would sing. The reason he worships again, the reason we worship and sing, it's the revelation of who he is. It keeps who he is in front of us. It keeps the glory of who he is right in front of us. It's true worship to Yeah. Are you guys okay? I'm just gonna read. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to preach here. I'm just gonna read here. Now, when I get down to my See when I get to that green down there? Green in my Bible is love. When I get to green, that means love. All those colors mean something. That's love. So I might have to preach a minute there. We'll see. But therefore, 
Because we were raised with Christ, we're seeking those things above, not the things of the earth, set our mind on things above. Why? Because you died. You didn't just pray a prayer to go to heaven. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who in his own life appears, you're going to appear with him. Therefore, because this is true, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, it's all idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience, in which you and me and everybody all walk when they live in them. But now, you yourselves, wow, are to put off these things. It's not an article. It's not pray the spirit of anger off of me. You yourselves are to realize I was never made for these things. Watch. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off the old man and his deeds. Well, I was just told to pray this prayer in case I hit a tree and I died and didn't know where I was going. And that is not why we preach the gospel. It's not a self-serving, beneficial thing. It's a transforming, life-changing thing. Come on, anybody can pray a prayer because you're afraid you're going to hit a tree tonight. And you're supposed to be angry at your spouse, sleep around and treat your kids wrong. What does it matter if the whole world prays that prayer and doesn't change from the inside? Then we've heard them. This is the whole point. He even misrepresented something he gave. It's about being changed. It's about being born again. Watch this. You put on, you put off the old man and his deeds, and you put on the new man. Who's the new man? He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who see. The cross brings us back to his image. Christ in us. Hope for the rain. Verse 12. Therefore is the elect of God, holy beloved. Now I'm at the green. Watch this. So we just put off the old and he listed. Anger, wrath, malice, fornication, passion, evil desire. Put it off. Die to it. Realize you were never made for these things in prayer. Get a look and say, God, you never made me for any of this. And then you put on his image. Here's his image. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. That's patient. Bearing with one another. Not having issues. Bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, don't file it with Mary and Susan. If any have a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also. This is all scripture, guys. We were not taught and trained by life to live this way. We were taught and trained by him to live this way. Be careful who you listen to, your own feelings, your friends, other hurting people. Be very careful that he's your teacher. I've seen people fight against the word. They think the more people they get to agree with them, the more right they are. And they're all going to find them wrong. It doesn't matter. He has. With me, that's not hardcore, that's just straight on the truth. I've had people call me for my opinion. And I said, you really want my opinion? You know what God says. Because all I know is what his word says. And then they say, well, you want me? I just want to hear what you And I said, yeah, but do you already have your answer set up? Have you already found fear of people that are saying what you feel? Why are you really calling me? Because you can tell sometimes when you call you get discernment that it's not helpful. And then you tell them what the Lord says and they go do a different thing because three other people are telling them it's okay. But if you can't find it in him, it's not the truth. Bearing with one another. And even as Christ forgave you, you also forgive. Now listen to verse 14 and I'll close. But above all these things, put on love. What is love? Doesn't seek its own takes no account of wrong done to it, then why are we so busted out by so many things? Why do we have so many issues and memories? Why do we have the court case laid out in our mind of how they did it, when they did it, and what they want? If we really walk it out. Because if God hit us with that court case concerning our lives, we're going to be The reason we're sitting here with folks is because God is alive. And He made you in His image and He made you in the same. So I promise you, friend, on Resurrection Sunday's now not the day to have an attitude, a detrimental mindset, or a perspective that's not life-giving. And please don't get trapped thinking for yourself. 
seek ye first of all. If you just think for yourself, you don't even think you have a right to be mad or disappointed with God. And that's a sure sign of the fall. That is the clay of finding all the next to great God. What a sign of the Jesus. And then the rationale, there are so many people that are sure they have a right to be perplexed with that at all. I heard a preacher once say, I was watching a preacher talk, and he said, I was just like, I just wanted to get up, I couldn't embarrass him, but I just wanted to confront the whole thing. I was like, oh. He said, listen, I understand that we're all going to be mad at God at times. And sometimes, from his end, it looks confusing. Because it's like, he let this happen, he let this happen. So I would never tell anybody not to be mad at God, because we're all going to get mad at God from time to time. It's going to look that way. I'm like, I preach, so I say, it's ludicrous to be mad at God. While we were dead sinners, he sent his son. He made a way out. He's not the problem. So let's not soft metal human emotion and keep it alive. Let's kill it so we can see clearly what it's like. Just saying. Listen, this might have been what you expected on Easter Sunday, and I didn't know what I expected. I just got up here and put on the line. And here's the thing about what I'm saying. It's what makes you a believer. Right? You gotta hear what I'm saying apart from any other factor of your life. And you gotta say, what am I gonna do with this kind of message? Where do I really stand with this? Am I really surrendered? Am I really willing? Or do what other people do not know? How I feel and think is that now? Or am I letting the word of God renew my mind and I'm starting to agree with you? Come on, guys. What you do with your life is your privilege. I'm a preacher. I carry a message. I'm crying out from the rooftop of your life. I'm just saying that. Hey, Hope you're listening. I hope you didn't just come here because it's Easter Sunday. I hope you didn't come here to hear the truth. Because if you just came here and it's Easter Sunday, I might be offensive to you. It might be, aren't you kind of man? <laughs> oh, yeah, your motives give you away. The way you respond to things tells you about it. Jesus preached. They were mad when it all <laughs> That's a lie. They were so filled with the wrong wisdom. They were so alive in themselves that they had the right to decide all the time. Sometimes you can sit in a service like this, and the highest revelation you get is getting in your car and saying your friends are making things back up. Well, I don't know. Purpose and reason for me. Yeah. And that sort of beats discouragement. 